Welcome to this webinar hosted by SA Accounting Academy, creating opportunities to connect our partners to succeed. Our CPD policy is compliant with IFAC IES 7, which is the international standard set by the International Federation of Accountants, which relates to continuing professional development. Subscribers also gain access to various rewards. These rewards include discounts, reduced premiums, and other free stuff which is accessible through your online profile. These are our reward partners. The webinar recordings, slides, additional material, and assessment will be available at the end of the webinar within your online profile. You can claim your CPD for this webinar at the end of the webinar through your online profile after you have successfully completed the associated assessment. Whilst every effort has been made to ensure the accuracy of the presentation and handouts, the pre presenters, authors and organizers do not accept any responsibility for any opinions expressed by the presenters or author, the contributors or correspondents, nor for the accuracy of any information contained in the handouts. Copyright of this material rests with SA Accounting Academy and the documentation or any part thereof may not be reproduced either electronically or in any other means whatsoever without the prior written permission of SA Accounting Academy. Feel free to ask your questions during the webinar in the chat. These will be addressed in the formal Q&A at the end of the presentation. The East Coast to the West Coast of South Africa, for those of you that are from Joburg, uh, Durban, Cape Town, uh, Port Elizabeth, as it used to be called, Pretoria, Cities I've grown to love over the last 10 years of working with various organizations, including South African Accounting Academy and SICA. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this first of um, three sessions that are going to introduce you to some exciting and dynamic management training that I know will make a difference. Let me just tell you about my background. Um, I qualified with a little company in the city of Southampton, England. That little company uh, is called Deloitte. But I yearned deeply uh, to be able to start my own accountancy business. And so after qualifying and being a manager with a medium sized firm in the city of Bristol, England, I launched my accountancy business. Truthfully, the first day I sat there and thought, my gosh, what have I done? I'm, am I condemning myself to just a lonely future? Well, I soon got over those worries and concerns. I built up my accountancy business. It wasn't that big. We had 55 staff and were turning over somewhere in the region of two million pounds, which I think at today's exchange rate is about 40 million rand. But then I just felt the need to try and continue being an entrepreneur. So I started a marketing company. My customers were all accountants. My products were marketing materials like budget reports, tax cards, newsletters, firm brochures. And in order to promote the company, I launched myself into the marketplace as a management trainer. So I established myself as a famous person in the UK marketplace and built up the United Kingdom's largest uh, training company and publishing marketing company for accountants. And then one day in 1999, and those of you that have started your own business, I suspect you would relate to this. I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, full of fear and worry. And the reason I was worried was because I now started this publishing company 
And the word on the street back in 1999 was that everything in the future is going to be done on the internet. And I just built up a, a company that was grossing one and a half million, 30 million rand, selling to 1500 firm accountants. And I thought that having left my successful accountancy business, I was going to be losing my publishing company. By eight o'clock, when my wife came down, she said, where have you been? And I said, I've been worrying about whether we're going to have a company in the future. But during those six hours, I conceived what is acknowledged as the world's first shared content system, whereby one firm has the same content as another, apart from the unique things like about us and our services. And so we built up the UK's largest internet company of accountants. 50% um, of the company was mine, 50% belonged to SIFT, who if you go onto the internet and put accounting web, you will find the world's largest community uh, for accountants. Lots and lots of help and lots and lots of information. So here's a few signposts for you. But all of that time, uh, I have continued to be a, a consultant to accounting firms. Some of you might have seen or even attended some of my lectures for the Academy and for your uh, South African Institute. So that's my journey. Uh, I learned about management because I needed to know how to manage a very fast growing accountancy business. You see, as today, Institutes don't do a great job of training firms in how to manage the accountancy business. We use osmosis, how it's been done previously, what we think we should do. And what I want to introduce you to is to some formal training, uh, which I hope will help you. We're going to be having three sessions and South African Accounting Academy will give you the dates if they haven't already. So really by now you've gathered that I've got to the age and the colour of hair, which entitles me to call myself a consultant. But as a consultant, I'd like you to know this. I am only ever 65% correct. In other words, it's OK for you to see things differently. You see, what I say, what I impart is really not that relevant. The only thing that is relevant as I share through these management ideas and principles is what you think, what you believe and what you're going to go and do. And if there's one thing I found in this profession is that there is a massive problem with what I call FTI, failure to implement. But what I would say is that in the 72 hours after your country went into lockdown in 2020. I was amazed how South Africa and other countries where I have clients, how quickly you transformed from working in the office to working online. For years, there had been debate in many firms, possibly larger than yours, I'm not sure. But the debate raged with people asking, you know, why don't we let staff work at home? And maybe the older generation saying, I'm not so sure we can trust them. And so there was sort of like a, a paralysis by analysis. And then suddenly when COVID came in March 2020, the debate ended as the rush to work from home to make sure that we continued to survive, continued to serve our clients. So really at the end of these sessions, it's what you think that's really important. And remember, FTI, it's not what you know, but fellow accountants, it's what you do with what you know that's really important. The, the reality is that we only have so much change energy. And there's no question that this has been severely stretched these past 18 months. So come with me while I share just a few insights from my Ignite online practice management training program, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more when we've got through this first session. Remember, um, it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. In other words, management is all about implementation. 
making management happen. The world has certainly not stood still since March 2020, but maybe 19 months on, maybe we should all take stock and aim to be more intentional about our plans, what needs to happen and who will take delivery responsibility. I understand the challenges that you face. I should do. I was talking to a client for a couple of hours in Joburg last night. She has been a client of mine for some time and is struggling with the quality of work that's being passed through. She's almost working 24 seven. She's certainly working seven days a week. Both partners are working flat out, trying to serve clients taking into account the fact that with staff perhaps taking sick days and not able to come in, there are challenges. You have challenges with regulation. Um, you may be one of those firms that have Erba making visits to you. We, we just live in a world massively impacted by this invisible killer of a pandemic. So uh, problems and challenges continue to reverberate. Although I have evidence, the resilience and the capability of accountancy business owners to address these challenges. During these past months, firms have demonstrated high levels of client service, speed of thought, communication and action. And yes, I know it has taken a huge toll on so many of us, our staff, our clients. So let me just ask a few questions because management consulting always starts with diagnosis. I cannot dive in. And because of the nature of this workshop, I have to assume that you're going to consider the questions, make notes. But I want to ask you this, how satisfied are you with what you do and the results you personally attain? What is your work-life balance? Um, are you generating the income that you need? You need income to live today, to invest today, and also to provide for that day when going to work is not your first thought of the day. We call it retirement. And sadly, I know too many accountants who sort of retire but take work home. You know, you work hard. You serve your community. A good business owner should be capable of being financially independent by their time they're 55. Are you not a good business owner? You see, if you continue to work after 55, let it be because that's what you really want to do. I was financially independent when I sold my group of companies at the age of 49. And now, almost 20 years later, I'm working because I enjoy what I do. I love the people I serve. Are you winning enough business to enable your firm to grow? Incidentally, there are two types of accountancy business, and both are perfectly normal and acceptable. The first type of accountancy business is the sole trader who works in accountancy and tax to generate an independent income. The second type of accountant is the accountant who starts a business desiring to grow, desiring to employ people, desiring to have a position in the marketplace that has an element of prominence. Are you happy about the state of play in your accountancy business? If you were to list down the three to five must solve problems. Maybe they're problems that existed a year ago, maybe even two years ago. And here's the challenge. You know, if you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep on getting what you've been getting. So how happy are you on a scale of one to ten? One is not very happy. Ten is ecstatic. I can't imagine any of you are on a, 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 a ten, let alone a nine or an eight. What is it we can do? Let us be intentional about our management. Let us not accept that we cannot improve what we're doing and how we do it. We've asked if you're happy, what about your staff? There are some larger companies who are living in fear of what we call 
um, the great resignation and the great resignation which is already being experienced by some companies around the world is where staff decide to leave in this country in which i live in the united kingdom there are massive shortages in haulage in the leisure and recreation industry because staff are leaving and not wanting to go back and there is a fear amongst accountants that this will happen to accountancy in fact i was asked recently for the things that i could see happening in the future that we don't know about today now i don't know the validity of anybody who tries to forecast the future because let's agree this anybody who tries to forecast the future is only ever guessing and so if you hear me saying things i do not know with certainty what is going to happen what i do know is that i think it's massively important for you service providers to get to the end of your career to be able to look back and feel that you were well rewarded, that you served your clients well, and if you're employing staff, that you were a good employer and you trained and built up the people who you call staff. Now, I was lecturing, interestingly, for South Africa Accounting Academy. And I can't quite remember the lady, but there was a, a lady, she was the HR director, I think, of RSM in Cape Town and she came up to me after the end of my uh, session for uh, South Africa Accounting Academy and she said Mark she said we no longer call people staff now that came as a surprise to me I said so what do you call them and she said we call them talent well that was a new one to me um, for me talent when I was back in the 1960s used to be sort of young girls uh, but so how things have changed so I've asked you a lot of initial questions. I'm hoping to take you on a journey. Uh, switch off your email, switch off any distractions because this morning, I want you to take a long, hard look at your best client. And your best client has to be the person, the firm that you call your firm. So I wanna help you find the power and motivation from within and provide strategies that will give you impetus, balance and increased profitability. We're going to look at your performance through our partner performance model. We're going to talk over these next three sessions about how you can position yourself as an advisor, somebody who gets paid for the business advice you give. So many accountants, perhaps in this area, should register as charities because they're so accustomed to giving away advice. We need to be able to identify our uniqueness and see how you can position yourself head and shoulders above your competitors. We need to ensure that you provide the services and the value clients need. Clients have to have certain services, such as some companies have to have audits, People have to file financial statements with SARS. And so those are services. They're, they're com we call them compliance services. They're essentially driven by the past. 95% of the hours in an accountancy business are driven by the past. Last year's financial statements, last year's tax return. But 95% of your clients' energies and thoughts and actions are all about the present and the future. And the more you can position yourself as somebody who can help them to make a better future for themselves, the more you will create value, the more you'll be able to charge for the value you create, and the more you and your client will become locked in. In other words, as we move on from the compliance environment, which is increasingly being served by the technology companies, we have to have a uniqueness in the services we provide. And incidentally, the battle lines are already drawn in the future, as far as I'm concerned. And the battle lines look like this. Technology companies can provide at an instant the results that you provide. 
they can populate tax returns, they can populate financial statements, profit and loss accounts and balance sheet. But these statements that they provide are based upon the inputs from your client. There is no assurance with the work they do. And that is where your uniqueness in giving assurance, reassurance, that your client is paying the minimum number of rounds in tax, absolutely possible. What we have to do is to speed up the delivery of our work because technology companies will deliver it instantly. And we have to move on from pointing the finger at the client and say, the reason why we're so late is because the clients do not provide the information. We must get to the point where our lockup, that's debtors, including VAT, and work in progress at realizable value. We have to drive down the lockup to the point where maybe it's no more than 10 to 12 percent of our gross income. You see, many accountancy firms have lockup exceeding 25 percent of their gross income. In my view, that's prima facie evidence that they're not providing a timely service. It's OK to blame the client. No, it's not. You see, remember, well, when you point the finger at the client, there are three fingers pointing at you. What we have to learn to do isn't to fix people. We need to improve processes. How can we upgrade client loyalty and transform clients so they become advocates for your firm? How can we identify those clients who truly need the additional service capabilities you can offer them? And how do we develop closer, richer, trusting relationships with clients? Think of a triangle. At the bottom of the triangle, there is trust. And over here, there is confidence. Unless the client has trust and confidence in your services, in my view, you do not have a professional relationship. You have, if you like, uh, a product relationship where they come to you just to do the numbers. And there will be those clients in that category. But what we want to try and do is to develop a close relationship so that we're not just the client's trusted advisor, but we become the client's most trusted business advisor. We're going to look during these sessions at how to develop outstanding service so that clients become advocates. We're going to look at how to improve job satisfaction for yourself and your staff. No, <laughs> forgive me, yourself and your talent. And we're going to look at how we can improve profitability. We're going to do that in this first session. At the get-go, I am going to demonstrate and prove to you that I can help you to improve profitability. It's important that we learn to work smarter, not harder. I am not going to give you a smorgasbord of ideas and solutions that will have you working harder. We've been through decades of that in this profession. No, we need to work smarter, not harder. We're going to look in our next session at pricing and billing. Um, I was with a client for two days at the end of last week. And it took till the second, sorry, the, the afternoon of the first day before I suddenly realized in asking them a question that they have got costing records, but they never look at them when it came to determining the price. And I realized there was something wrong when they told me that their potential gross income was about a million pounds based upon the capacity analysis, but their income was only 500,000. In other words, they were only realizing 50%. Typically, an accountancy business should be realizing 85% of recorded time. And so we're going with them on the journey to look at how we help them to make more profit. Incidentally, one of the most important numbers in your accountancy business isn't the fees, isn't the charge rates. Here's what I'd like you to do. 
calculate the number of chargeable hours that are invested in the firm's services. So calculate your chargeable hours, the staff's chargeable hours, and divide that into your top line, into your sales. The resulting number will give you the actual revenue per billable hour. What was it one year ago? What was it two years ago? What is it based on the budget? If there's one number I want you to focus on driving up, it is the revenue per billable hour. Whilst we're into numbers, because we're all accountants here, here's another number. Take the total number of clients you've got and divide the total number of clients into that same top line. The resulting number is will give you the revenue per client. And again, what I want to ask you to do is to drive up the revenue per client. Oh, incidentally, one of the things you could do is you could um, create a minimum fee. Let me ask you this question. You have 10 clients and you're charging each client 2,000 Rand, 20,000 Rand. You have one client whose fee is 20,000 Rand. Is it not true that that client will be more profitable than those other 10? Because they all require servicing. They all require letters. They could all phone you. And so setting a minimum fee of how to set the minimum fee. Here's one way of doing it. And this is what I do with my clients. Take a spreadsheet, list out all of your clients in column A, and in column B, write down the, num the value of the services. So the total of that column will equal the top line of your accounts. Go and sort so that you have the highest fees at the top and the lowest at the bottom. Count up 10 from the bottom, and that number probably gets you fairly close to your minimum fee. So introducing a minimum fee can help you improve profitability. Incidentally, there are probably some clients that you've had who are no longer appropriate for your services. My client last night in Joburg, we were talking about the fact that we have to drive down the amount of number of clients that we serve because my clients are just not surviving. They are in severe danger of health issues and they recognize that. And so are there clients that maybe perhaps could be better serviced by somebody else? We're going to look at how to avoid price disputes. Um, incidentally, why do clients leave? Some people say, oh, they leave because the fee is too high. No, clients never leave because the fee is too high. Clients leave because the value isn't high enough. And think about it. If 95% of your work is based on historical, the only reason the client's coming to you is because first of all, they know that they have to file. And secondly, they trust you to help them minimize their tax bill. What we want to try and do, or oh, incidentally, when you have finished your accounts, you may meet with the client, you may send them a letter. And in that letter, you will record the amount of tax they have to pay. And in that letter, you may well include a time bomb. Oh, sorry, I don't mean a time bomb. I mean the invoice. And so, the client, first of all, has to accommodate to the quantum of the tax they have to pay SARS. And nobody likes to pay a rand more than is necessary. And they also have to accommodate to the fact that they've got to pay you for doing it. No wonder clients sometimes drag their heels in submitting the information to you. Because first day of their new financial year, they don't really get excited about preparing and submitting everything to you. It's not the first thought on their to-do list for the day after the year end. The client 
the entrepreneurs that you serve, the people who are selling their time, they want to get out and make the next year, make the next month, make the next week, make the, ne make the next day successful, profitable. They want to do their business. They know that when they give you the financial statements, they're going to find out how much tax they owe. And so what we need to do is to transition our services as indeed the way in which our services are being prepared by technology companies, we need to meet the challenge and we are able to meet the challenge. Use technology to improve timeliness and use your ability, your personal relationship with the client to help the client become more successful and more profitable. Winston Churchill, um, oh, here we go. Somebody said to me the other day, is that a virtual bookshelf? Well, if that's a virtual bookshelf, I couldn't do that. So here is a book by the statesman uh, Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill at Winchester Boys School, when he was giving a speech, gave the shortest ever speech. He simply stood up in front of the boys and said, never, never, ever, give in. And so that's my advice to you. Uh, don't be a quitter. Work harder, but work smarter. Remember that every day you have is a gift. None of us can assume that we're going to even be alive the next day. Um, I had a pretty awful situation a week last Friday. Uh, my wife was taken to the hospital in an ambulance with a suspected heart attack. Um, and as I waved goodbye to her in the ambulance, I wasn't able to go with her because of COVID. I, I honestly wondered whether I was going to see my wife again. Thankfully, she came back later that day. She hadn't had a heart attack, but she had contracted COVID. And this morning, 10 days after she was tested positive, our national health service system uh, announces that after 10 days, you're free from COVID. So I encourage you, take small steps. Do you know, change energy. It is recognized by industrial psychologist consultants that an individual or an organization can only manage between five and eight changes in a 12 month period and five is a much more realistic number than eight. Now, whilst that's what industrial research psychologists tell us, personally, I think in 2020, that number went through the roof. I mean, you did so well accommodating to this killer of a pandemic. Some of the challenges that firms have, uh, I mean, going forward, as staff continue to work from home, one of the challenges that we are facing in the accountancy business is the cry for WFH, working from home. Incidentally, if you go onto my website, ignitepracticemanagement.com, ignitepracticemanagement.com, you can sign up for my bi-weekly blogs. One of the topics this year, I think I've written about five blogs on working from home. My latest view for what it's worth is I'm encouraging firms not to take the decision to integrate a compulsory entitlement to working from home. There are clamors from staff who now are seemingly more in control of their work and where they work than ever they have been in the past. In the old days, employers were in control. Today, employees are in control. Uh, there, I'm not so concerned about whether the staff will work, which used to be the concern. My concern is that, and there is plenty of evidence, that people are turning their computers on from seven in the morning until seven and beyond in the evening. Mental health is an issue. Unbelievably and sadly, there are reports in this country 
that during this pandemic, 80%, 80% of our children have suffered mental health issues. How true is that? I have two grandchildren in the city of Bristol where I live. Both of them have had issues. Both of them have been seeing counsellors. And so working from home was a temporary solution. But what happens to training? What happens to people passing on skills and abilities? What happens to the firm's culture? Uh, what happens when staff are working on the kitchen table and the children come home? Uh, no wonder there is a lack of focus. No wonder there are concerns. When people work in the office, they experience community. They experience their peers being able to help them and encourage them. Uh, some firms are saying, well, maybe we pay staff less if they work from home. I understand that there are some advantages. Flexibility. Everybody wants flexibility. Lack of travel, reduction in travel time. Uh, but I think there are some concerns. And all I would say is please read my blogs and maybe add the thoughts in and the ideas that I express to your own current thinking. Some firms lack a market focus. Do you know what? They cannot describe in 15 seconds what sets them apart. You see, we are all unique. You go up to somebody and they ask you what you do and they say, oh, I'm an accountant. Isn't that a conversation killer? You know, what is unique about you? You know, I help people grow their business. I provide solutions to the business owners of this community. Come up with some way of not actually saying, I'm an accountant. Um, I help people explore how to improve the quality of their life. Tell me more. I have one client in Manchester, England, who used to say to his um, professional referrals, and even to some of his clients, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, what did he say? Um, I'm an astronaut. That certainly got the attention. Yeah, an astronaut is so exciting. I tell you what, about two years ago, I was on a journey back from London at a time when there was a short strike. And so for two hours, Paddington Station, which is the station that you use to get to the west of England, was just filling up with people. Eventually, I got onto the first train and I was in the corridor of the train. And everybody else was pushing around me. Uh, I thought, well, do you know what? Let's start a conversation here. So I said to one gentleman, I said, so what is it you do? He said, I'm an IT consultant. Well, that's just about as exciting as being an accountant. He said to me, what, you, what do you do? I thought it was much easier just to say I'm an accountant. So the conversation went nowhere. But there was a lady in front of us. And I said to her, um, what is it you do? And she said, I take people up in hot air balloons. And so we started talking to her. She got her iPad out and showed us some photographs. It was interesting to listen how she trained and the safety procedures and the people that she's taken up. So make sure that we've got a clear market focus. Make sure that you have a clear USP that distinguishes you from other people. Some firms partly through COVID, but partly through natural attrition, are experiencing an eroding client base. In the United Kingdom, we have already lost 10% of our clients because our tax authorities allow small business owners to submit three numbers. That's all the tax man wants. Sales, costs, net profit. That's all the tax man wants. And figure three comes as a function of one and two. In the future, here's what's happening in the United Kingdom. And incidentally, can I just say SARS follows very closely what HMRC in the UK do, as I have noticed from some of your legislation while working in South Africa. And so we need to make sure. Where was I going with this? 
um, I took my eye off you all and I just looked at the field where there are six deer. So I need to get back on track. So some firms are experiencing, an, and if you think I have a script for this morning, I haven't, <laughs> forgive me. Um, so some firms are experiencing an eroding client base. Clients are being stolen away. Oh, I know where I was going. So 10% of clients we've lost because of three line accounting. 10% of clients we are going to lose because of what is known in this country as making tax digital. And here's what's happening. In 2023, businesses are going to have to submit quarterly accounts to the tax authorities. And it's a challenge for accountants who are already in arrears. It's a challenge for clients who now, within 30 days after the end of each quarter, have to endure submitting figures to the tax authorities. Here's my prediction for the profession in the United Kingdom. Is it true in South Africa? We've lost 20% of our clients or are about to lose them. The remaining 80% will require three or four more times work than currently you're doing from them. I encourage you to take these sessions as we come towards the back end of 2021 and create some plans to describe what you have to do to build a business that is going to be fit for purpose for serving clients. Because I no longer think the term outsourcing describes the revolution that's taking place in the future. I call this stuff insourcing because clients will increasingly see you as an internal member of the team, serving them, assuring their numbers and making sure they're compliant. Hey, here's what I want to say to you. You've got the idea. I'm a qualified accountant. I used to have a business with 850 clients. In 20 years, I have not filled in a tax return. I give the information to my accountant. You say, why, Mark, when you could do your own tax return? Hey, I've got a business that I'm passionate about. I love doing my work as a management consultant. I love writing articles in the hope that somebody will get some benefit from them. I am quite happy to let my accountant do the stuff which he is qualified to do. Surely, as the volume of reporting increases, your clients want to go and be shopkeepers, hotel owners, restaurant owners, uh, manufacturing company owners, technology companies, health service companies. They want to concentrate on their business. That's why you personally are massively important. The client doesn't want to keep tapping information in and thinking, is this right? Let them come and engage with you. Present yourself who is somebody who is up to date and able to help them. You will not then suffer an eroding client base. Some firms are enduring low billable hours. Here's my metric. A firm owner should be doing a minimum of 1,200 chargeable hours a year. 1,200 chargeable hours. We're going to be looking at a metric later on, so I won't go into further detail at this point. Some firms are not particularly proactive in the area of marketing, or can I call that business development? Accountants don't like the term marketing, or at least if you do, there might be somebody in your firm that says, well, I didn't come into this business to do marketing. So they're not as proactive in business development. Or some people say, ah, oh, there's a boom going on. There's clients everywhere. We don't need to market. Or then they say, oh, there's a recession. Can't afford to market. Here's what I want to say to you. We need to have a consistent approach to marketing. There are two major commitments in the marketing activity. The first one is, I do need your cash. Typically, consultants around the world recommend that a, a minimum of 3% of cash of your total firm revenue should be invested in marketing. But what is more important 
isn't your cash. What's more important is you, your time. People do business with people. And although there is an increasing amount of activity being done through things like social media, I find many accountants are not really engaged with social media. You know, what we can do and what we have learned is there has been a tipping point as a result of COVID. And the tipping point is that now, like this morning, people are prepared to meet online. The beauty of this morning is that while I'm teaching, you don't have to travel to a seminar room. Hey, importantly for me, who lives between the cities of Bristol and Bath, I don't have to get on a plane and fly 11 hours to Joburg and get to Oliver Tambo Airport and work my way through all the queues and what have you. So let's think later on in these sessions a little bit more about business development. Other challenges, uh, I have two clients at the moment. Uh, I was with one uh, about a month ago and on Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm going to be with another client. And we are transitioning the firm from the founder and in both cases, we've done an MBO or an MBI, management buy-in. Uh, many firms have not got planned succession. The next generation of leaders has not been identified and given the encouragement to grow. Incidentally, Ignite Practice Management is an amazing program based upon 35 years of my experience covering a whole gambit of areas designed to help your next generation of leaders grow and be equipped. All of my clients that I serve are given access to Ignite to allow them in their own time with their own thoughts to develop their plans based upon what they're thinking and hearing. I talked already about my clients in Joburg last night. It was a pre-meeting prior to having a, an online partners meeting at the very beginning of November. So I was just talking to the managing partner, talking about the agenda, talking about the importance of implementation. Too many firm owners are devoting too much time at the cost of their personal lives, while others perhaps have opted out of devoting enough time to what is, I acknowledge, in these COVID days and in the days of SARS and in the days of Urba, an incredibly demanding profession, especially as we have clients who are more demanding, shouting out, help, how am I going to survive? Change is all around. Uh, and so as a result of there being so much change, people are aware of the change, but today we're just busy, busy, busy. There isn't enough resource to get done the work that we're doing. And planning is just not focused on the needs of tomorrow. So let me come alongside you as a coach. I hope in the first part, excuse me a minute. I hope in the first part where I asked you some questions, you might have got some questions written down that are appropriate to you. In the second part, I've tried to give you some propositions to challenge your mindset. And again, remember, you really don't have to agree with me. I guess if you really don't agree and don't like me, you'll have switched off and probably you're not hearing this. But please stay with me. This is not about liking me. This is about your mind going through a journey with somebody who has got a track record for over 35 years of working with global firms around the world, sole practitioners, two, three, four partner firms. You see, top sports teams hire coaches. Uh, Ronaldo, one of the best players in the world, um, has a coach. Uh, there's no way that coach was better than him. So top sports teams hire coaches, players hire coaches. Some people I know hire life coaches. I have a friend uh, who is a life coach and um, my friend's sister was married to George Harrison, one of the Beatles. 
And then she married Eric Clapton, the guitarist. And so his specialism is life coaching people in the music industry, which is a real glamorous industry, isn't it? So here's what I was going to ask you. Please allow me to come alongside you as your coach. I'll be very clear. You've not been asked to pay for this course. Uh, the organization that has hired me, South African Accounting Academy, have kindly allowed me to talk to you a little bit about Ignite. And do you know what? I'm going to leave it till the end. I hope you'll listen, but that's up to you. I want you to listen and take my ideas and where you find them helpful, make them yours. Ownership of change programs, ownership of change has to be yours. After these sessions, don't even mention the word Mark Lloyd Bottom. It's not what I'm saying. It's what you're thinking that's really important. Just a few key concepts, compliant and, and definitions, if you like. Compliant services are those services that look at the past. We call them audits, accounts and tax. Specialist niche services, you either specialize by industry or you specialize by service. If you specialize in an industry, you'll be specializing in healthcare, retail, and all those other things I've mentioned. If you have a specialist service, you have a service that can apply across at least 80% of your clients. So it could be uh, management accounting. It could be wealth advising. It could be VAT consulting. It could be a whole host of services, some of which you will already have delivered because your clients have asked for them. And that's a clue as to the services that you should be developing. Specialist services are ones that you can deliver value and services that you can make money from. We're gonna talk a little bit about what I call, uh, well, the profession tends to call them value added services. Sometimes they're called advisory services. I tend to call them extension services. That is those one small step services that clients can automatically expect you as the accountant to be the provider of. It could be such things as advice on selecting a cloud system. It could be help with payroll. It could be help with VAT return submission. It's the one small step that really enables them to say, can you do this? I was with this client last week and they described the situation and, and the partner at the end said, I'm really surprised they didn't come to us. I think it was the client was looking for some loan facilities and the client felt strongly they should have come to him for advice. And he was a little bit miffed that they hadn't. Again, the more you spend time with clients, the closer that relationship, the more they will inevitably come to you for counsel, for help. Make yourself available. Let them text you. Let them phone you. Let them email you and make sure we respond quickly. 30 years ago, if I got a letter, it would have taken three days to have got to me. It might have taken another two or three days to get the reply back to the client. Now we live in an instant era. You send somebody an email and you expect to reply very soon, if not instantly. And vice versa, when clients email you, they say, how come he or she hasn't replied already? We're going to look at the role of the expert versus the role of the advisor. When it comes to audits, accounts and tax, you are the expert. When it comes to the role of advisor, here's the key difference. The role of the expert involves you asking questions and telling the client what to do. The role of the advisor is diametrically opposed to that model. When you are doing business advisor, it is not about you giving solutions. Remember, ownership. What you have to do is ask the client questions and explore and enable the client to come up with their own solutions. You can give a few prompts. Have you thought about this? But we need to make sure 
that we allow the client to come up with a solution. It is tempting and irresistible at times to give people solutions, but ownership is important. You see, if you give them the solution and they don't implement it, then they've paid your fee, hopefully. They haven't done anything other than perhaps let you down. But when they come up with the solution, if they don't implement, they've let themselves down. We're going to focus on chargeable time or time on, as I sometimes refer it. And I'm going to distinguish in your chargeable hours between what I call visible time and desktop time. We need to talk about the importance of nurturing your talent. Remember, they are actually volunteers. As some firms have found out, they can hand their notice in and leave. The other thing, perhaps radically, I'm going to tell you very clearly that some of you have to move on from what I call 20th century billing practices. Some of us are so rooted in a century that ended 21 years and nine months ago. So listen out for that. You'll find it, I think, challenging and interesting. I'm going to talk about the fact that all time is an investment. And from that time, you expect a return and clients expect a return. Here's what I always say. Your fees do not cost the client. We're a profit center. We have to make sure that the client can recognize the value that we bring. And I want to make sure that we talk about some components of outstanding quality. So as accountants, we must make the best use of our time. After all, it is not a renewable source. Uh, in about 12 days time, in the city of Glasgow, Scotland, 400 miles from where I'm sitting, uh, we're going to be seeing COP26. 25,000 people are descending on the city of Glasgow to talk about the climate crisis. And boy, is there a crisis. We all recognize that. The number of floods, um, the number of um, times that cities go without rain. Um, our next generation, our children, our grandchildren, are going to suffer at the very highest level if you have got grandchildren of five years of age or even children of five years of age by the time they're 65 at the upper end of forecasts make what you will a forecast at the upper end of forecasts in 60 years time global temperatures will have increased by eight degrees and you can't rubbish this you can say you don't agree with it but we cannot keep putting off the decisions about our climate. So the difficulty for all of us lies not in listening to someone like me and others with new ideas. The challenge is moving on from the old ones. In other words, those ways of doing things which are familiar and comfortable. We, we serve in a profession with massively wide ranging performances. I have one client who about 15 years ago I met, and when I first started talking to him, I found out he was working 4,000 hours a year and only making 9,000 pounds. What's that? Um, 180,000 rand. It's just unbelievable. And yet I've come across other firms. I have clients in London who are making 400,000 pounds per partner. What's that, eight million rand? I just want to ask you this question. And incidentally, I can remember my first day in the office when I was just coming out of full-time education. I went into the office and I saw the young lady behind the desk called the receptionist. I thought she looked absolutely gorgeous. And then I found out that it was my job as the latest member of staff to make coffee. And when I went down to make coffee for the staff, there was Susan, this receptionist. You see, it's just like yesterday. And yet now um, I passed state retirement age a couple of years ago. 
and I look back and I think, gosh, you know, some of some of those thoughts are just still very vivid. And I want to ask you this: What does it look like when you roll your thoughts forward and imagine you are close to retirement day? And I want you to go forward. For some of you, be five years. For some of you, it may well be twenty-five years. And I want you to roll forward in your own private time and look back and reflect on your career. What is it that you wanted to achieve? And all I would say to you is, as you open your eyes, maybe, and come back to today, what is it you've got to do to make that view of your career a reality? When I met my wife 46 years ago, I said this to her. It was part of my chat-up line, I think. I won't always be an accountant. I intend to have three businesses. I don't know where it came from, but it kind of stuck with me. And today, as I look back, I've actually, if I count this consulting career, I've actually had four different careers. And if I was to be unable to work tomorrow, I know that I am satisfied with what I've done. You've got time to make a difference to your future. What is it you want to achieve? It might take time to execute your plan. I'm meeting with this uh, two partner firm from Joburg and because of the dire situation, I said, we're gonna create a plan that starts on the 7th of November and you're gonna finish 25th of January before you get to the February. And I then said, on the 7th of March, we're gonna pick this up and we're gonna run with it right the way through 2022. I'm determined to be their accountability buddy to make sure that the problems they're experiencing, which have been there for 10 years since I first met them, are dealt with once and for all. So there are three core ingredients for a remarkable accounting firm. First of all, to look great. Secondly, to sound great. And thirdly, to be great. If any of you know Michael Carter from Australia and practice paradox, you will recognize that from Michael. So I read that from Michael one day and I thought, that's really good. Look great, sound great, be great. So here are three, my three ingredients for a remarkable accounting firm. We need to be smarter. We need to be better than others. And above everything else, we need to be faster. I've got a question for you. What is the purpose of a business? Well, I asked that question of accountants and accountants say to make a profit. Would well, you remember I said to you at the beginning that I'm only ever 65% correct? Well, this morning, I want you to know it's okay for you to be wrong. Oh, you see, the purpose of a business is always to meet the needs of its clients. Profit is one of the outcomes of running the business. It's how we keep score, if you like. It's not the purpose of the business. Oh, and whilst we're talking about uh, questions, let me ask you this. Um, the name of your best client? Do you remember that question from earlier on? I want you to know and understand that it's okay to consult this morning with your best client, your firm. A few basics about communication. Um, during this process this morning, where I'm talking and you're listening, I'm speaking at roughly 160 words a minute. But your brain processes words at a rate of 600 words a minute. So in other words, there's massive capacity, which is, let me prove it to you. Some of you have been looking at emails. Naughty, not supposed to do that. Uh, some of you have given little messages to staff who've walked in. Some of you have been thinking, do I agree, do I disagree? Are you with me? There's a whole stack of things going on in your mind. What we need to try and do as professional advisors, remembering that this is the same with your clients, is we need to engage with them. Now, when I'm lecturing and standing up, I can do that very easily. But this morning, I'm sat down in my studio and I'm not really moving, apart from the fact that my hands seem to be having a life of their own. So what we need to do, First thing on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock, 
we need to be full of energy five o'clock on a friday your last client we need to be full of energy people expect us to be enthusiastic and energetic unbelievable when we're giving them advice they expect us to be empathetic let us not be um as john cleese the english comedian said oh you know accountants are boring hey we're not boring we're exciting we're dynamic we're essential and we're here to help you the client so make sure that you have energy and enthusiasm all the way through the day when we talk about what it is people remember do you know that as little as seven percent of what is said is heard and remembered and eight percent of what we say sorry eight percent of what people remember was never said what i'd like to do is i'm just going to if i can work out again how um, this works this morning i want to just go on to some slides so i need to just open this slide and i hope you can see my first slide can somebody say yes mark yeah okay what i'd like to do is i'd like to take you through my partner and firm performance model uh, i'm hoping you can see that on the screen so there are five keys to firm profitability and these five keys emanate from four management activities so as professional business owners the four activities are on your screen you engage in productivity doing the work pricing telling people how much they've got to pay managing your costs and managing your clients those four management activities give rise to the five keys i'm not going to define them i'm going to give you an example so let's just take an example of a company where there are eight firm owners and 64 people in total including the partners so eight partners 56 staff your leverage which is the l of lubrum is eight in other words take the 64 and divide it by eight so the partners are managing themselves plus seven other people here's what we find in a dominant audit practice typically the leverage is somewhere in the region of 12 or more our next slide those 64 people give rise to 65,000 chargeable hours which means that the average number of hours is somewhere in the region of a thousand those 65,000 hours give rise to revenues of 8.2 million of uh, which uh, incidentally i understand these are probably pounds not rand forgive me the principles are there which means that the average billing rate is 125 incidentally never ever tell clients what your charge out rate is unless you are doing dedicated work for them and if you're doing dedicated work for them still don't charge tell them your charge hour just tell them the price for the job hey let me ask you this question what have you paid for in the last 12 months that you didn't in advance know the price for that question is usually followed by silence clients want to know how much their service is going to cost the reality is is that they already suspect that this year's fee is going to be last year's fee adjusted by inflation so those 8.2 million time on aren't fully recovered and you'll see that this firm is recovering 85 percent and that their revenue per hour is 106.25 the margin after deducting salaries after deducting overhead costs is 30 percent and um i've lost track no i've never used this system before the net result is net income per partner okay so let's strip out the numbers i'm on slide eight okay let's slip out the numbers 
Here's the model. L by U by B by R by M, lubrum. Multiply those numbers together and you end up with the net income per partner, which is interesting because we now know the five touch points where we can impact profitability. Let me just look at this example. Look at partner two and three. Partner two and three both work in total 2,400 hours. Partner two charges 35%, partner three 60%. Not unusual. I've come across people who've done 800 hours. My client last week was doing 1,600 chargeable hours. Billing rate, not a vast difference. Realization rate, not a vast difference. But just look at the contribution that partner three is making compared to partner two. Here's what I'm saying to you. Small changes can make a big difference. And OK, all of the right numbers are with partner three, but they're not that different from partner two. You see, the first benchmark I want to give you is that I need you. If you are running a firm with three or four employees, the first thing is I want you to take home as profit a minimum of your own charge rate. In other words, staff are covering salaries, staff are covering overhead. And I hope it's a good deal more than that. So what I'm going to do is I just want to look very briefly at one of the sessions from Ignite, um, no, which is called Lubrum Based Profit Strategies. So here we go. So now I'm going to give you 17 or 18 ideas in the next 20 minutes before I tell you a little bit about Ignite. I want you, first of all, to set a chargeable hours target for the year. Uh, and I don't want you to track the year's figure. I want you to break it down into 12 months. Because just imagine you start tracking this stuff in January. January is the month where people perhaps get, I know we're in the Southern Hemisphere, Hey, in the Northern Hemisphere, we get colds, coughs, sneezes, and flu in January. So that doesn't work in South Africa, does it? So let's just assume that in the first month, perhaps you're unwell, and maybe at the end of the month, for whatever reason, you don't quite make your monthly target. And then the second month, you struggle, and then very soon, you've lost interest in your annual target. Break it down, chunk by chunk, into 12 monthly targets. Celebrate the months when you exceed your target and move on from the two or three months where perhaps you don't succeed in achieving your target. Always, always capture your time daily. Hey, we used to keep time sheets, manual paper sheets, but now we do it in, on computers. And guess what? Still, people at the end of the day aren't capturing all of their time. I can't think of anything worse than going home on a Friday not having dealt with the daily time recording. I mean, it's Monday morning. Have you filled in your time records for last Friday? Uh, if not, do it in about 25 minutes time when I finish. Recognize that an hour only has 50 minutes. It's okay to go and get a cup of coffee. It's okay to go to the restroom. We need to make sure that you know an hour is not, don't write off an hour every day for the normal personal activities. That part and parcel of serving the client. Uh, so, um, if any of you have ever seen, I wrote a book. I'm going to have no books left on my shelf. This was published by Psycho, and it's called Clients for Life. And uh, one of the modules is called Developing Outstanding Client Service, because I found lots of new great ways to super serve clients. One of the things I encourage firms to do is to develop a structured plan for meeting with clients, whereby you meet with some clients, your best clients, before the year end, after the year end. And those are two essentially compliance meetings. So if they're your best clients, we take you through how you can improve the service by meeting with clients for two non-compliance meetings. Remember that you always manage what you monitor. So no burying our heads in the sand here. Make sure that you track every single week 
what you're doing. And I'm going to take you through in one of my next sessions on a little module on how to improve job profitability. And let's move on to R. We need to remember to bill people promptly. What I always say is this, we need to learn to bill our clients while the tears of appreciation are moist on their cheeks. You know, and that's why lock up, that's why work in progress needs to be within 5% of your annual income. Can I tell you this? Um, the top 200 firms in America, on average, have work in progress of 5% of their annual revenues. And if 200 large firms in America can do it, don't tell me you can't. We need to improve our processes and our communication with clients. Hey, let's just imagine you've got this 21,000 Rand client. Don't wait to send them a 21,000 Rand bill. Uh, you might use uh, debit orders to get paid monthly. Uh, you might send out interim bills. And if you're going to send out an interim bill, don't allow those two interim bills of 7,000 to be outstanding as you finish the job. It might be off work in progress, but before you know it, it's in the 90 day column. If there's any balance in your 90 day column, can I tell you what that tells you? If there's a balance in your, even in your 60 day column, it tells you something. It tells you this, the client has a problem. Now, maybe they have a problem with some of your work, in which case, surely you as the partner need to get onto that and address it. It could be that they're not paying you because they have cash flow problems. Again, that's another flag to get in touch with the client. Or thirdly, it may be that the client is abusing you. Hey, they pay other people within 30 days. They pay for their cell phone within 30 days. We are their most trusted advisor. It is unacceptable for clients not to pay you. Hey, we need to have real attitude here. They are not going to abuse us like they are. Oh, and incidentally, the fee, fixed fee trap is simple. And it's simply this. When you bill by the time, the risk for the cost is on the shoulders of the client. If you take 10 hours, you're gonna bill them for 10 hours. If you take 20 hours, you're gonna bill them. So they will try and manage your time as much as possible, or they'll quibble when they see your fee note. But if you bill on a fixed fee basis, the risk is reversed. And you need to manage that risk because now the risk is incumbent upon you. And again, in Ignite, we talk through the ways in which you can guarantee to manage that risk. Realization, uh, we need to make sure that we look at jobs where there's consistent under recovery. Uh, perhaps we can let staff do the billing. And above all, we should under promise and over deliver. So now we're going to move on to look at billing rates. A few things. First of all, make sure that you increase your charge rate by two times the rate of inflation. Ah, oh, Mark, we can't do that. Nonsense. Of course you can. I'm only asking you to change the number on your computer system. I'm not asking you to increase the price that you charge the client. And instantly the word price is a much more common term than the word fee. Who uses the word fee? Incidentally, that is a 20th century word. So use the word price, conform to the language of the world. Uh, do you have more than one rate? Maybe you're doing some more valuable work compared to the compliance work. Maybe you're doing advisory work. Maybe you're talking to the client about improving profits, solving problems. Maybe you should populate your costing records with a second rate. Now, um, I do find South African Accounting Academy, your uh, slides, I can't always tell where I am, so forgive me. Okay, utilization, we've covered that. Uh, structured plan for meetings, bill promptly, 
avoid scheduling wall to wall. Uh, right. So you might have got some clients. Oh, clients who don't respect you. Clients who disrespect your staff. Clients who never pay you on time. Clients who don't deliver information on time. One of the strategies that we're talking about in this partner meeting that I'm holding very shortly is the managing partner has agreed to create a list of clients that they're going to move on. And so point number four, consider moving on your worst clients. And then finally, um, if a client says to you, oh gosh, that's expensive, please recognize that's expensive is not a complaint it's an observation uh, and be very careful about agreeing a reduced fee sometimes clients are trying it on you see the internet today has made everybody price sensitive and people realize they can negotiate they can challenge uh, number six do you literally take every client on just because they can fog a mirror or fog a glass. Do we have a client selection policy? Hey, a very simple client selection policy is based on your minimum fee. It could also be based upon industries you want to service, industries you don't want to service. A client recently said to me, uh, we have a system for uh, deducting directly tax payments from people in the construction industry. It's called CIS, Construction Industry Scheme. And one of my clients recently said to me, we don't want any clients from who are on CIS. I said, well, that's fine. Get rid of the ones you've got and don't take on any more. And then finally, and I know, I know this is a challenge in South Africa. From the very first time I started working in South Africa, 10 years ago people were saying to me we have problems with staff and um i've explored it and i just have to accept that that's the way some of you see it but be very careful not to keep on taking as some of my clients do the workload and the responsibility and the correction and i think do you know what i think this is definitely where my 65 percent rule comes in i know that you are going to um challenge some of the things that I say but I want you to know that if you experience the power of delegation uh, you will be able to free yourself up to do a higher level work and so I'm going to just very briefly introduce you to oh gosh that went very quickly I'm getting better uh, you have to understand that I'm not used to some of these things so here we go so um, I'd like you to have a look online at Ignite Practice Management. Uh, you'll find there, there is a free module there. Uh, it's the four letter F word, F R E. Every single one of the seven modules, uh, I've taken a very brief look at um, the first one, which is Kaleidoscope. The second one is delivering outstanding client service. Each one has a little short film of about 10 to 15 minutes where I'm talking about what it is you'll learn. And if you go on to Ignite, you'll find that each of the pages for all of the programs tells you exactly what you're gonna get. It tells you about the sessions. It gives you free downloadable files. And there's just huge value. And ultimately, can I also tell you that if you invest in Ignite, which in total is 24 hours of training. If you don't think you're getting value, you just simply click the button and you get your money back. So very briefly, um, through uh, the agreement I have with your academy, uh, you are entitled to a 30% discount. And uh, although the price there says £797, uh, that's because this is coming to you on a fixed slide. Uh, I'll give you the RAND cost very shortly. So Ignite Practice Management, which has built in a discount compared to buying each of the programs separately, uh, that has got seven modules 
which in total is 24 hours. It's got a series of 60 plus films and those films last about 10 to 15 minutes each. So it's all broken down into very easy to watch modules. So the first module is Kaleidoscope. We've covered a few components of it and I hope that that has demonstrated the value. Kaleidoscope is somewhere in the region of six hours of material. So we have only scratched the surface. And somebody has said, am I going to download the, the slides? All of the slides, uh, plus, 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 are all available online. And uh, you can see them online. Secondly, perhaps the subject that I'm known for most is how to improve uh, client service. And I wanted to come up with a, a way of describing it, which was different from before. So I've called this four hour program, the dynamics and rewards of outstanding client service. Moving on, um, probably another of my flagship programs, bill what you're worth and collect what you bill. I think I've just said one or two things which are embedded in this program. Uh, and if you think that you've got four hours, I guarantee personally, you will get huge benefit and we will show you how to take steps to reduce your lockup. And then finally, uh, a three, no, thirdly, uh, a program on improving staff pro profitability. And I'm gonna introduce you to some of the components of how to increase job profitability. I have uncovered in the last five years some absolute gems on how you can improve your job profitability. Then perhaps one of the most important growth areas, I'm going to go through some essential training on how to improve the delivery of business advisory services and get paid for it. And then a subject which uh, I was once upon a time known as the marketing guru of the UK. Uh, I can never claim that title today. I am not an expert on social media, but boy, will I uncover for you some real great winning ideas on how to build the business. And then finally, it's important to avoid FTI. There is a one and a half hour program on how to avoid uh, failure to implement. And so finally, here we go. In RAND this time, if you were to invest you're not spending money, I guarantee that you will make profit. As I hope out of this free session, you've got some good ideas. If you use the code SAAA30, the cost for the whole program, if you go for all seven, all 63 sessions, all 24 hours, the 300 page manual, massive number of downloadable files, and a certificate to say that you've graduated in practice management. The cost, the investment after your 30% discount comes down to 11,000. I hope like the many others who have invested in this program that you will find this of value. And there we go. I have spent the last uh, hour and a half bar four minutes. Uh, timeliness is important. Whenever you start a meeting, always start on time. Uh, don't wait for those stragglers to come because that says to those who turn up on time, uh, your time isn't worth it. These people can turn up late. And importantly, always make sure that you finish a meeting on time. And I like to think that with three minutes to go, I can now hand back, and again, forgive me, this is my first online session for uh, South African Accounting Academy. And I wonder, is somebody from the Academy going to come online or am I going to be the one that says, thank you for attending? I'm going to wait 10 seconds. If there are any more questions, put them on the chat pad. Um, tell me if it's been a help to you. Um, tell me what you've got out of it. Um, remember, it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know that really counts. Some of the action points, look at your chargeable hours. Uh, some of the action points, look at your revenue per um, billable hour. Um, what about looking at the revenue per client and how you can drive it up? Have you got a business plan? Hey, do you know what? Uh, I've asked accountants uh, all across South Africa, how many of you have a business plan? 
The answer is probably based on hands, about 25%. If you don't have it in writing, you don't have that same commitment. Even as a sole practitioner, I used to take myself off for three days on a retreat. I would study, I would write, I would create help sheets for clients. And I just wanted space to be on my own from the noisiness and busyness of uh, what in those days was 20 people who worked for the company. So uh, South Africa Accounting Academy will be telling you when the next session is. Here's what's coming up. We're going to look a little bit more at client service and we're going to look a little bit more at pricing and billing. Again, my guarantee is that you are going to make some investment in time but from that investment in time, I promise you that you will get ideas, creativity, challenge, and hopefully um, a, a, somebody who has been around a long time might still have relevant ideas to help you youngsters serve clients, serve the community, uh, make a good profit, uh, enjoy a good work-life balance, and have a load of fun in the process. So with that, I am going to sign off. It is now exactly coming up to 11.30. I wish you well for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week. If any of you wish to email me, my email address is mark at markloydbottom, all one word, dot com. Mark at markloydbottom.com. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. Uh, I'll see you again next time. Thank you. If you have any other questions, please use the chat. If you would like to email a question, please email to technicalquestions at accountingacademy.co.za. Thank you for your participation. We hope to see you next time.